one of our panelists has 15 minutes to present. And following the presentation, our panelists will, there will be a time for question and answers. And as was mentioned earlier, there will be a microphone because we want to make certain everyone in the audience has an opportunity to hear what you're asking. Um, therefore, we are going to get started. And before we go any further, uh, we are going to follow um, our panelists as they appear on our program today. So we're going to start with our Dr. George Sedbury, who's the Sanctuary Science Coordinator for the Southeast Atlantic, Gulf of Mexico, and Carib Caribbean region of the Office of Natural, National Marine Sanctuaries, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, as we like to call it in Savannah, Georgia. They're going to present um, each of them on their own. And one of the things I would like the panelists to do, I want to challenge them even further, although this topic matter is challenging within itself. One of the things as I study this and begin to analyze what has been done across the country is how do we prioritize? And I think that was a question we heard on the film we watched a few moments ago. So after the panelists is presented, at, at the end of your time, I want you to tell the audience or suggest and recommend how do we prioritize. And then the other question I would have you answer for us is who should champion this very important matter? Is it our elected officials? Who actually carries the responsibility? And I have my thoughts, but I'll keep those to myself and let our panelists um, answer the questions. And so without further delay, Dr. George Sedbury. As was mentioned, I am with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And, and NOAA um, runs many programs that you might be more familiar with, including the National Weather Service, where we get our weather from. It also has an, an, a national climate program that tracks climate. Um, I'm in the uh, National Ocean Service, and the National Ocean Service runs the National Marine Sanctuary System. So in the National Marine Sanctuary System, these are uh, very much like underwater national parks. There are 14 of these areas off of our coast. The closest one to Charleston is off the coast of Georgia, Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary, and it protects a natural reef off the coast of Georgia. And then off North Carolina, we have the Monitor National Marine Sanctuary that protects the uh, the shipwreck of the uh, Union Ship Monitor. So these, at these 14 sites and at many other sites along our coast and in the ocean, NOAA is monitoring oceanographic conditions and it's monitoring weather and it's monitoring climate. So NOAA keeps track of these things. My background is in fisheries biology. So um, the, way, the way I've been looking at climate changes and changes that we see in the ocean that are related to global climate change have been sort of how it might affect fish and fisheries. And there's a lot of different ways that, that climate change is going to have an impact on fish and fisheries. We know that sea level's rising. We know that the ocean is getting warmer. <laughs> and so what we're seeing is that habitats, the important habitats that fish require to complete their life history are moving. So for example, we have a, a thriving uh, blue line tilefish fishery that, that uh, has gone on for decades, mainly off the coast of South Carolina, off of Georgetown, South Carolina. That fishery in the last few years has moved north. They're now catching those fish off Virginia and Delaware and New Jersey. And the landings in the middle Atlantic states are, have, have now exceeded the landings in the South Atlantic. So we're seeing fish moving north to find the water temperatures that they prefer. And importantly, the fisheries are moving north as well. So the fleets are following the fish. Those fish that um, at one time may have been landed predominantly in Charleston are now being landed in other cities. So it not only affects the fish and fishing, but it affects coastal communities that depend on uh, the, econ the economics and the income provided by landing fish within those local communities. Our local restaurants, uh, dock suppliers, tackle suppliers. This has a trickle effect down the, down the economy. Uh, fish, fisheries are worth about uh, 200 billion in the United States. And um, we have the numbers for the state of South Carolina for the Southeast too. I don't have those numbers on the top of my head, but it's easy for me to remember 200 billion. It's a pretty big number. So for the whole country, fisheries are worth $200 billion and employ 1.7 million people. So when these fisheries start to change and uh, move out of the region, uh, and take that 
uh, economic impact with them, it affects our local communities that are involved in not just the fishermen, but the restaurant trade, tourism, and, and other aspects as well. Um, in addition to these commercial fisheries, there are recreational fisheries, and they're also being affected by climate change as well. And recreational fishing is an important pastime for a lot of people, and it's important for our economy as well. Uh, a lot of tourists come to Charleston, they like to fish, and they, they, want to be able, they expect to be able to catch what they've always caught. And if things start to move, we need to figure out what's going on and to plan for those kinds of things. So the, the increasing water temperatures that we're seeing, that we're, we're documenting in our national marine sanctuaries and that we're, we're seeing in other places along the coast are, are causing fish to go on the move. And there's actually a fish on the move uh, website that you can go to and, and people, fishermen are reporting unusual catches that they're getting, species that they've never seen before that are starting to show up in their area are being reported. So we're employing citizen scientists to uh, report their catches so that NOAA can keep track of these changes. And of course, we're doing more rigorous scientific sampling as well, but we really depend on people to report the unusual fish catches that they see. Um, an, another big example is the black sea bass, and a very important fishery off of South Carolina. Um, black sea bass are starting to be landed in the Gulf of Maine. Uh, you know, they occur in the Gulf of Maine where there's rare records of, of these fish in the Gulf of Maine, but now there's a fishery up there. So things are definitely warming up. Uh, we see other important species in the South Atlantic in addition to the blue line tilefish are wreckfish and uh, snowy grouper. And they support really important fisheries uh, off of South Carolina, mostly off of South Carolina, but those fish are starting to show up in the middle Atlantic states and they're setting world records. Recreational fishermen are catching these species up there in record sizes, so things are definitely on the move. Now, we can, we can deal with this, but it takes planning, and we need to uh, conduct research to find out what's moving around and what's, what's staying still, and we need to be able to have flexibility in our management plans to uh, maintain these sustainable fisheries. We need more cooperation between states and between regions and among agencies so that we can continue to manage these fisheries for sustainable use. It's not like the fish are going to go away. They're just going to move someplace else, and they're going to re be replaced by things that we haven't figured out yet. So, um, so again, my, con my concerns and my interests are mainly with fish, but the fish affect coastal communities. There are, you probably know people involved in fishing somehow, whether they're running a restaurant or are a fisherman or work on docks where fish boats are landed um, or, and pick up supplies. There's a lot of people in our communities that are associated with fishing, and so we need to plan for these changes that are going to uh, come as a result of climate change. The other thing that, um, that, that goes along with climate change is ocean acidification, and that was mentioned in the, in the video. So the carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere that is causing our atmosphere and our oceans to warm also becomes dissolved in the ocean. And when you d dissolve carbon dioxide in the ocean, it forms carbonic acid, and that means the ac acidity level of the ocean is going up. A lot of the species that we depend on in fisheries, 57% uh, of our landings in South Carolina, for example, are things like oysters and clams and shrimp and crabs, and they have shells that depend on a very narrow range of acidity in the ocean. And we're finding in um, not so much in the southeast, but in other parts of the country where ocean acidification is a bigger problem, that these fish, these uh, shellfish are failing to grow. Um, areas where they grow clams and oysters and have hatcheries to grow these animals are having a hard time getting their animals to grow on, on clam farms and on oyster farms because the ocean, uh, the carbon dioxide is making the ocean more acidic and harsher for these animals to grow. And so, uh, in, in our area, we also have the problem of habitat. A lot of the fish that we catch offshore are associated with reefs, carbonate reefs or sandstone reefs or coral reefs. And those kinds of reefs depend on a very narrow range of acidity in the ocean. And when that, when that ocean starts to become more acidic, those reefs can actually dissolve. And we're seeing dissolving coral reefs in the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, for example. So the, the effects of climate change are on temperature, on ocean acidification, and it affects the fish, the fishery, and the habitat that those fish live in, and the communities that depend on those fisheries as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sudbury.
How do, how do we prioritize? Uh, you know, I, as, as was mentioned in the video, and I've said it too, there's a lot of things we don't know. Um, we have, there's a lot of complicating factors in fish, one of which is fishing itself. And so, um, to me, the biggest priority is we need to understand all the variables that are affecting fish populations. We know that fish react to temperature changes, and whether those changes are seasonal or on decadal time scales or on much longer time scales. So we need to be able to sort out what's happening in the fish populations that result from climate change versus normal variability versus the effects of fishing. So that requires additional research and of course requires additional money. Um, but research to figure out what the, what the effects of fishing are going to be. My highest priority would be to uh, support additional funding uh, for fisheries research in our state and federal fishery management agencies. Thank you. Our next presenter is Ms. Laura Cabanis, Laura Sullivan Cabanis. Laura is the Director of the Department of Public Service, the City Engineer for the City of Charleston. I know Laura well. She stays busy all the time. <laughs> She's dealing with a critical issue of infrastructure, which again impacts our society. Laura, if you will talk to us about climate change and infrastructure. Sure. I think what I'd like to do is kind of tell you a little bit about the history of Charleston and drainage. You know, Charleston has, um, has, has always been affected by drainage and flooding and has had an intimate relationship with the ocean as a seaport town. So it's something that leadership in the city has struggled with for a very long time. The mayor, um, he talked about the Mayor Pinckney in 1837 and the $100 gold coin that happened. And as a result, they really didn't find a, a, any solution at the time. But they continued to fill in creeks, and when they did so, in order to carry the drainage, they built a system of large brick arches that were about five feet tall, three feet wide, and they had timber plank bottoms. Um, and they were generally laid to be flat um, at the creek bed. The size wasn't designed based on the amount of storm water or the flow that would go through them. It was basically big enough so that men could get in them and clean them out into the future. They didn't think about putting manhole covers in them, so they'd actually have to go in with a pick and an ax. And they also had a system of gates on each end, which I find was, it was probably a great idea. It wasn't quite engineered right, but they had a gatekeeper that for many years would close the gates on, on low tide and then open the gates again on high tide. And the idea was that the water would rush into these tunnels and stir up the sediments and, and other things that had deposited in the tunnels. Then they would lower the gates again at high tide and open them again at low tide so to allow the water to rush out. Now you have to imagine these tunnels completely crossed the peninsula on Calhoun Street. So there really was never an opportunity to get enough flow through those tunnels for them to work. The next really um, significant change, I think, for the city of Charleston great regarding flood, um, you know, addressing flooding issues was, I think, in 1974 when the city um, adopted FEMA's floodplain um, national flood insurance program, and that began to use, to use maps developed by the federal government to, uh, to identify the base flood or base building elevation and flood, or flood zones within the city. Those maps weren't um, um, very accurate at the time. You know we've come a long way now with LIDAR information and technology and computers that make those at maps even more accurate. But that was probably one of the first um, steps the city took to be becoming more resistant to flood events. And then in 1984, it completed its master drainage and floodplain management program or, or um, plan. And um, that plan laid out, it, it studied the city as a whole, not just the peninsula, but West Ashley, James Island, Johns Island, and looked beyond our borders at the time because stormwater doesn't recognize jurisdictional boundaries. And we knew that the city was going to continue to grow. So it drove, it, it, identified all of the individual drainage basins throughout the city. It did an inventory of every drainage pipe that was 24 inches and bigger, found out where all of our outfalls were. And then the biggest, um, 
the, the most important part of the study was to identify all those lo the locations and quantify the locations where drainage problems existed and then begin to prioritize those problems. So, um, and it, it, it basically looked at where were we getting property damage, where did we have safety issues like evacuation routes. Um, it also prioritized projects based on things like what was going to be most affordable, what, would, what could you spend the least amount of money on and have the biggest impact. And when the same time the plan was adopted, the city um, passed a two mil tax assessment on business license fees and on, on property taxes, and that was the first funding source for the first drainage improvement projects. It raised about nine and a half million dollars. It got us started on one project west of Ashley called the, um, in the Ardmore neighborhood where people would wake up in their homes and find their coffee table floating and sometimes 18 to 24 inches of water in their homes. First project we started. And we also started the project that we call Calhoun East. And for people that have been here um, for more than 20 years, you'll know that when it rained really hard downtown and when we had high tide, the intersection of Calhoun and East Bay Street was impassable. The water was, um, well, chest deep on me, so probably about three and a half feet deep. Um, and so we built a pump station and we built a very deep, 140 feet deep tunnel the tunnel runs from Concord Street up to Marion Square and then up to Mary Street. And that was significant because that has now become the model for other drainage improvement projects that we've been working on. We've also completed drainage improvement projects in Burns Down. Burns Down was built around the 1940s with um, so, some very small drainage pipes and very few inlets in the streets and they had lots of problems in Burns Down. That's been corrected. We've made drainage improvements out in um, the Church Creek drainage basin, which is Shadow Moss, which again was affected by flooding in October. And we're currently working on the Market Street drainage project. Three phases are done. The tunnel's in the ground. The pump station's been upgraded. And shortly at the end of this year or the beginning of next year, we'll be working on the surface improvements that will tie all the surface drainage in Market Street into the deep tunnel. One thing I'd like to point out is that there are three large shafts that go down to the tunnel already. And in October, when we had that huge rainfall event, which was over 20 inches or 17 inches, we were able to keep water out of the sheds with just the three main shafts that had gone in there. So feeling very successful about that. Um, one of the things that, you know, I think a lot about is we're not going to be able to engineer ourselves out of everything and we really need to be seizing the opportunity with all of the development that's going on right now as quickly as possible to get people to think about what will happen with their development that's happening if we have one and a half, two and a half feet of sea level rise. So you're building a neighborhood that's going to be around for hundreds of years. Now is the time to think about that. And now is the time for the city to look at what our development regulations are and make sure that they have that sustainable component in those development regulations. You asked who should champion this? I did. You know, I, and, I, and I think the people have to champion it. I think the citizens have to ask their leadership and their elected officials to make this important. And I think we need to think about it across the board in everything we do. It's, it's, it's not just an engineering or an infrastructure problem. It's, um, it's how do we develop the land? Can we create smaller footprints and build taller buildings so that you've got more affordable housing and less impact on the land? I think it's, you know, we, we need to look at everything we do these days and say, how is climate change going to affect it and make that an important part of our planning process. Laura, infrastructure is so important to a community and a city. Are there measures in place now that teach us how to build to be ready for the, for the change that we know is coming in sea level rise? Well, in our new projects, and I didn't mention, we're, we're, by 2020, we will have invested about $235 million in drainage improvement projects, and there will still be more to do. 
Um, but we are looking at those projects right now with sea level. You know, every one of those projects that we're looking at, we are planning for two and a half feet sea level rise minimum and what adjustments will have to be made into the future. Mayor Tecklenburg mentioned the seawall project and we're looking at building the seawall two and a half feet taller and I think um, that will be a change on the battery but I think it says that we're serious about this and this is a once in a hundred year project. If we don't do it now, we won't likely be able to do it in the future. We need to be taking every opportunity while it's cost effective and we need to be addressing these issues sooner than later. Very good. Thank you so much, Laura. Our next presenter is Mr. Andy Ferry. He is the Chief Operating Officer for Charleston Water Systems here in Charleston, South Carolina. And we know water is essential to every aspect of living. And uh, as we heard on the uh, presentation previously on the screen, water also generates energy or helps to generate energy, um, which is critical for what we do here as well as throughout our community. Tell us uh, how the climate change will impact water. Okay, certainly. Uh, as mentioned, I'm the water guy here. Water and guy. so I'll be talking about the water sector, and that will include both drinking water and, uh, you know, wastewater. Sometimes people call it sewage or what have you. Uh, we call it wastewater, uh, kind of the polite term. I'm going to cover this sector at a national level, give you a little bit of an overview about what's happening on an industry-wide basis because the change in climate is in the forefront of the water industry right now. And I'm going to then kind of bring it down to the local level. I'll give you a real brief overview of Charleston Water System if you're not from the area so you'll have a little understanding about who we serve and what we do. And then I'll talk about a few specific activities that Charleston Water has going on and how we plan for and prepare for the changes that come with climate change. As you heard Jack Moyer say on the little video, uh, infrastructure, and Laura mentioned it too, infrastructure is one of the big re issues for the water industry. If you saw the, I think it was the American Civil Engineering Society uh, reported out that in America our infrastructure gets like a D uh, grade. So we're, we're not just barely passing. And so replacing that infrastructure, because it is aging, uh, is a real big challenge for us right now. Uh, and then finding the funding to do that. Uh, Laura's mentioned funding. Everybody up here has talked about funding. And so one of our challenges uh, on a national basis, on a local basis, is to get funding in place to make the changes that are necessary to be prepared. There are other issues such as water quality issues. If you watch the news, you're aware of you know, all that's going on up in Flint, Michigan with lead and drinking water. The summer before that, you may remember Toledo, Ohio, they had tremendous problems with a harmful algal bloom. Uh, that many people think it ties directly back into global warming and the change in climate. And we are seeing, just like changes in the fish um, migration, we're seeing more and more algal problems showing up. If you live in Charleston, you may notice from time to time your water kind of tastes like a little bit of pond water, huh? Mm -hmm. And that's because of change in, in algal populations in our reservoir. And then, of course, um, you know, there's the water quantity issue. Uh, making certain we have enough water in the future. Charleston, we're blessed. We have two strong water supplies, but it doesn't mean, you know, that we need to ignore that. And then finally, emergency preparedness. Uh, Mark's going to talk a little bit about that, I'm certain, but that's a big part of our industry's concern, being prepared for everything like what happened uh, back last October in Columbia. You may remember Columbia, South Carolina, they lost their water supply. Uh, and had to have a boil water notice for about, uh, I think, almost two weeks. So, a lot of challenges in the water industry. I'm an optimist by nature, so I think challenges bring opportunities. So out of this, we're gonna have an opportunity to do more and more risk assessments so that we understand where we need to put our resources. We're going to see more and more long-term planning going on because this is not a five-year, 10-year it's a 20 plus, 100 year plus process. And so we want to have good long-term planning and it's going to give us that opportunity to get our infrastructure ready 
for climate change. Laura talked about having the vision to see raising the um, seawall. So now's our chance to have the vision to look to the future so that our infrastructure is ready. And I did some old school notes, so y'all have to forgive me. I'm not flipping my iPad up here. <laughs> <laughs> so, so on the industry level, just a couple of things that are going on. Uh, most of you know the water industry is heavily regulated by EPA. So they write regulations that help us run and ensure public health is protected. But they also provide a lot of good information on how to do things like be prepared for uh, climate change. They currently have a program in place that's uh, called the Climate Ready Water Utility. And its main focus is providing risk assessment tools for us. They uh, have information on how to do that long-term planning. Uh, they have information on how we should train our staff and train communities in areas of um, climate change adaptment. And they also have a tremendous amount of research going on and a lot of resources. So we as a water utility take part in you know, that activity. So it helps us on a broad scale to be ready and to you know, know what the federal government has planning and what they have to offer for us. There are also professional organizations, the Water Environment Federation and the American Water Works Association. Both of those organizations have policies and programs that focus on you know, the contributions of global warming and climate change. And they look at it at a broad level. One of the things they're encouraging us as water utilities to do is look at what is our impact on the, the cause of climate change, not just getting ready for it, but how can we change what we do as water utilities to you know, be more energy efficient. If you don't know it, water utilities use a large amount of electricity to pump and move water and to treat water. So how can we be more efficient in that? And they're giving us guidelines, doing research, looking for ways to be more efficient, to reduce that energy usage. How can we reuse the water we have, you know, the wastewater? Can it be, you know, repurposed once we've treated it and cleaned it? Um, how can we recycle products that come away from our waste treatment systems? And how can we conserve, both conserve ourselves and teach our uh, users how to conserve. And then they look at green infrastructure um, and looking at uh, providing global research efforts because both of these organizations have pretty large research groups that are looking at all sorts of different things that impact and make water utilities more efficient. So that's kind of a broad overview of um, you know, what's happening on a national basis. Let me tell you a little bit about Charleston Water. We are a local, publicly owned municipality. We are a separate freestanding commissioners of public works. We have a board, board of commissioners, and they have oversight providing policy and guidance on how to run. Uh, Mr. David Rivers is one of our board members. Uh, Thomas Pritchett, uh, of course, uh, Mayor Tecklenburg, uh, Keith Waring, who's a city councilman, and Billy Koopman. So those guys work with us as staff to provide the water service to about 115,000 different accounts, uh, over 400,000 people in the Charleston area. We serve Berkeley County, Dorchester County, and Charleston County. Uh, the, we have wholesale water customers, so the Department of Defense, Sullivan's Island, Isle of Palms, uh, Folly Beach, Mount Pleasant, uh, all of Johns Island, who then provides water to Kiowa and Seabrook. All of those are our customers. Have over 1,800 miles of pipe, which if you put it in a straight line, would go from Charleston, I think out to Phoenix is about where it ends up now. Uh, 9,500 fire hydrants. If you ever have a burning desire to paint a fire hydrant, call us up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> As I mentioned, we have two water sources. One is the Edisto River up at Givans Ferry State Park. If you've ever been up there, you may have noticed the structure and behind a fence, and we pull water. And it comes through a tunnel dug, hand dug, back in the 20s and 30s, 22 miles down to a water plant in Hanahan, South Carolina. And then we also have another reservoir, Bushy Park Reservoir, and the water comes through an 11-mile tunnel to our water plant. 
There we treat about 62 billion gallons of water a day on an average, but we can treat up to 115 million if needed. On the wastewater side, we have about 55,000 accounts, and those are primarily in the city of Charleston, uh, which includes Daniel Island and Cane Hoy Peninsula. And then we master meter water from James Island Public Service District, uh, Folly Beach, also provide water to Ravenel, Hollywood, or wastewater service to water Hollywood, Ravenel, and Megan. We've got about 800 miles of sewer lines, uh, 185 sewer pump stations. Uh, that all comes to Plum Island, which if you've ever ridden across the James Island connector, right now you'll notice it looks like um, construction crane island because there are about five big cranes out there right now. But it can tweet, treat 36 million gallons of water a day. Uh, we're currently averaging about 22 million a day. So that's just a quick overview of um, where we are with, um, you know, Plum Island. Now just to tell you about some of how we approach um, our long-term climate change, we really look at it from an emergency preparedness standpoint. May remember those of you who run around back in 1989. There was this event called Hurricane Hugo, and you know we had a storm surge at that point in time that kind of was a wake-up call, especially for Plum Island uh, and a lot of our infrastructure. And that we recognize that the, had that storm just been misplaced down to Edisto, we would have seen what happened at Allendale, and it would have been a much different tale in Charleston. Uh, Mayor Turkland Tecklenburg talked about how we come together as a group, and I think everybody who lived here then really saw that right after Hugo, how everybody pulled together. Um, and But we, as an organization, kind of took that as a wake-up call to begin to think about how can we handle long-term sea level rise, and along with that, the periodic rapid sea level rise you see when a storm surge comes in. Yeah, you, know, you kind of think of it as a, a hurricane and a storm surge as kind of gl global warming, sea level rise on steroids, if you will. Uh, happens over a much shorter period of time and much more violent. But if you're prepared for that, then you're going to address many of the issues that come from you know the climate change issue. We came away with a master planning program that included some risk assessment of what was our critical infrastructure. And we've done that for all areas of our operations in terms of water, wastewater, what we call water distribution and wastewater collection. Also our information technology group, our asset management group, our, uh, what we call our SCADA group, and part of our strategic planning all includes being prepared for these type of events. They look out for 50 years, and then we have capital improvement plans that look at about a 20-year window uh, for improving the infrastructure. So anytime we now do a capital project, it includes looking forward to what's needed to protect it against that, that storm event that's going to come along and perhaps, perhaps keep us from doing our job. And our job is to provide that water and sewer service even through a storm event, and even long term as climate change impacts us. So we're working hard to ensure that sustainability element. If you ride by right now and look at Plum Island, uh, what's going on out there is we're replacing one of those deep tunnels that we use to bring wastewater to the plant. And we're installing some new equipment that will make us more efficient and effective in providing the waste treatment. So. Plum Island, the highest point on it naturally is 16 feet above sea level. Uh, as you know from storm levels, storm, storm surges, it can get a lot higher than that. So we have gone through and projected those critical elevations based on information from NOAA and other governmental agencies so that we can withstand the storm surge of a Category 5 storm. If you ride across the bridge, you'll see a big building out there. It's got a big, nice green roof. It sits up in the air. There's a great parking garage underneath it now. We can store all sorts of things there. But all of the equipment, even the generator, the, the emergency generator, are all above that storm surge. But you don't do that overnight. It takes time. Um, so we are 
taking a long-term approach in everything from the types of pumps we use, we're transitioning over to what's called uh, submersible pumps, the dry pit submersibles, they can operate in the dry or they can dry operate if they're 150 feet underwater so that we can keep those pumps going even whenever there is a storm surge that could inundate the plant temporarily. All of this will work together to help us be prepared for that long-term sea level rise that comes with climate change. At our water plant, we're also doing infrastructure uh, changes. We have changed things with our chemical feed system that make us more efficient, again, reduce energy uses. We are replacing right now, have some projects to replace some old infrastructure. Some of them, one, one particular thing we're replacing has been in service since 1902. The accountants tell us it's now fully depreciated and we can replace it. <laughs> so, so we are replacing this old technology sedimentation basin with a new device that uses one sixth of the footprint, is much more efficient in terms of cleaning the water and uses much less chemicals and much less energy. So all of those things go together to improve our capacity and to lessen the impact on the environment lessen that global change that comes about. We are making changes um, in terms of the rate of which we can filter water and change water. So there's a number of things going on at the uh, water treatment plant. A couple of other innovative things that we've addressed. Uh, you know, each of these plants generate uh, residuals, byproducts from the water plant. It's an alum residual, which is a material which is the dirt that comes out of water with a co co uh, coagulant added to it. From the wastewater plant, we politely call it biosolids. It's the solids that come out of wastewater, or actually it's the microorganisms that treat, treat the wastewater. But at Hanahan, we've taken the alum and we've done an extensive study working with the regulatory agency where we take that solids, which used to be put into a landfill, and we now dry it and blend it with soil and it's being used to cover landfills as opposed to being a, so it's become a resource rather than a waste. Plum Island, our biosolids, which used to go into a landfill, are now going to a composting operation that where it has changed into a fertilizer and is being applied to cotton fields now uh, to help improve uh, the growth and yield of cotton in South Carolina. So a number of things that are fairly innovative that all add in to reducing you know, our usage of materials, recycles the materials that come through. So just, just to close, a couple of thoughts. Good management is one of the main things that make this work. Uh, you know, even with Miss the Rivers sitting here, I'll say we have got a great board. They have a vision for the broad policies that are needed to keep this infrastructure being replaced. Uh, looking at risk assessment, long-term planning, you know, developing a capital in, uh, improvement plan, all of those things are what we as a utility need to be doing, and you can take that and extend it into other areas too. And then you have to execute the plans. You can make a plan, but if you don't execute it, it's no good. And then continue to keep innovative ideas flowing, continue to cooperate, and continue to educate. Uh, you'd ask who champions it, and Laura said this. I think it's each one of us. I think we all have to recognize we have a part in this. Uh, Jack Moy had talked about water conservation. We sell water, but at the same time, it's a valuable resource, and we want you to conserve it. You can do that in a number of simple ways. He talked about irrigation, you know, high efficiency, low use faucets, uh, high efficiency toilets. All of those things go together to help conserve. Um, and prioritization, I think that risk assessment really helps a great deal to help you understand where to put your limited capital dollars. With that, I'll be quiet. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Andy. One additional question I would have for you. You all have done an awesome job of creating a master plan. I think you said that extends to 50 years and a capital improvement plan that goes out to 20 years. Mm -hmm. What are the more effective ways that you all have seen for educating the community and making sure the community recognizes this issue and are implementing measures to um, proactively address them? Certainly. 
community education is important because one of the things that, you know, when you have a capital improvement plan, you have to raise money. Uh, mm -hmm. it, then in the, in, in the old days, I'll say, back in the day, there were federal grants available. They are you know, scarcer than hen's teeth, as they say nowadays. Sure. <laughs> and so we do that through um, selling bonds. And so we have to educate the public what's the value of water. Uh, there are national programs out that help it, you know, sell that, but we constantly put out flyers in our newsletters. We send out a quarterly newsletter telling people what projects are coming up, where are they. Uh, we use our website to educate the public. We also do Facebook and Twitter, trying to keep in front of the, uh, the public the value of water and let them know that we're being responsible stewards of the, of the, of the funds that they give us. Because we, we unfortunately can't print money. We, we have to get it from our customers. And so we have to be responsible to our customers and do a good job uh, so that they have confidence that we're doing the right thing for them. Thank you very much. Our next presenter is Mr. Mark Wilbert. And Mark is the Emergency Management Director for the City of Charleston. And I will just say, since Mark has been on board uh, with the city of Charleston, he's challenged the departments in a number of ways. As a matter of fact, I think we all now have emergency management plans. Um, he makes us do annual updates to those plans. Um, so he is really challenging us at a different level to be proactive about how we prepare for emergency management. And so without further ado, Mark, if you will present. Thank well, you. thank you, Gianna. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, the Aquarium and MUSC for uh, this entire initiative, this forum certainly, but this entire initiative is really important because getting the word out is, is the most difficult thing that we have in, in our emergency management world. What I'd like to do for the next couple of minutes is share with you from the emergency management perspective how climate change is impacting our profession and what we do and how it impacts uh, the city of Charleston. Uh, what I'd like to do first and foremost is give you an example of here today, right now, how climate change impacts us, uh, if, if not on a daily but on a weekly basis in emergency management. I'll context the problem a little bit, uh, what we're doing about it, and then talk very quickly about the future. Um, I would describe emergency management as the, uh, we're, it's the here and now of climate change. Climate change is here and now for emergency managers in a city that wants to lean forward and be proactive. Uh, I can give, you know, the obvious example already mentioned once before is increased storm surge. It's just a, a fact. If you start with higher tides, you have more water, you add uh, a lot of energy to that, you bring some type of a tropical system to it, you're going to get more water where uh, in years past perhaps you had, you had less. Good examples of that are Katrina or Sandy. Uh, they just caused a whole bunch of damage and you heard on the uh, video that we saw that they're happening more and more frequently. That's our future, that's where we are, that's what we need to prepare for. Um, but the example I like to use the most, and one that's very relevant to Charleston, is the combined effect of climate change. It's not just sea level rise for us, but it's this extreme precipitation events that we have. Individually, either one of those, currently we can manage on almost a daily basis. You get, we get 38 king tides in 2016. Well, that's going to cause some water down on Lockwood. It's going to cause some water over by the Citadel and other neighborhoods in and around the city. You're going to get water. But you add an extreme precipitation event to that, which are, they're, they're increasing, and I don't have the statistics, but the statistics are really scary how quickly they're increasing. You add those to a king tide event, and what was individually something that was manageable now becomes an emergency event. Okay, so now you have people at risk uh, if they happen and they coincide at the same time. So what has that done for us as a city? We now do a whole city response when we look out into the future and see a king tide, a high tide, and an extreme weather event coming. And again, that happens about 30 times a year for us. And it starts very early. The public works folks are out early. They're cleaning the drains. Most people wouldn't think that, wow, we got to get out and clean our drains because they get dirty, they get filled up. And if the water can't get out, you have a high tide to begin with. You can't get the water out. You're putting more water in, and you've got a city that's low. That really does impact the neighborhoods, and it's important. Public information. I'm, I hope you've noticed that we try to get out when we see that coming to caution people about coming downtown if they don't need to, to have people think about where they're parking their cars. If you remember just a year ago, we had the cars floating down Calhoun Street and other streets in our city. That's dangerous to have that happen. They're in the way of emergency vehicles. So we need to be proactively looking at that. We're now opening up 
uh, parking garages um, on a regular basis if we see that the level is going to get there so we can get those cars out of the street. Um, that helps to protect the cars, helps to reduce costs, but it also helps us if we need to get in afterwards, like I said, in those emergency vehicles. We work with the employers in the schools. Again, if we see an event coming, uh, we have some employers, the bigger employers, that we'll get right on a phone conversation with. MUSC certainly is one of them. And we'll be talking about reporting times, going home time for employees. How are we going to get employees in if we can't get into the city? Some of our critical staff that we all recognize now, we're all on the same sheet of music about how we get that critical staff in. And we have plans in place now to move them in should we need to do that. Um, same with the schools. Uh, one thing I learned uh, coming back to Charleston was that everything starts and stops with schools if public schools are in session. If moms can't drop, or moms or dads can't drop off their kids at school, they're not going to school, things are not happening in Charleston. So the schools have got to be at the table. Uh, we have an active road closure uh, that we're working with. We work with our local media, and I just got to say that our local media market is an absolute partner of ours. They're a wonderful group. Um, I have actually done this test. If we send a piece of information to them on a road closure or something that's dangerous happened, it takes about 20 seconds to make it to the bottom of the screen. That's actually how quickly it can make it for us. So they're a great market. They're wonderful folks that we work with. But we have in our GIS department, we actually have an active road closure app. So as soon as we close a road, uh, that appears on that app that somebody could, could grab it if they needed to. So what we try to do is we try to get ahead of some of the things that we had in the past, but at the same time we want to make sure we're prepared to do any type of rescues that we need to do uh, from a public safety side. To context this a little bit to the city of Charleston, Charleston is surrounded by water, we all know that, so sea level rise is an obvious one, more and more extreme precipitation. But then you add to that mix the development and the, how quickly this city is developing and that's an increase in population, um, we have to recognize that years gone by, and probably back in 1989, Charleston was, more, was not as much of an urban environment that it is today. There are very few urban cities, really urban places in South Carolina. Our state has a very rural focus. We are an urban city, so we stand apart from the rest of our state. And we have to begin to shift our focus and recognize us for what we are. We are an urban area. So if you put more people with higher risk and things are happening more often, um, that's the result of what we have. We have more people, higher risk, and things are happening more often. And that's something that we, again, have to do. So how do we, how do we deal with it? One, preparedness. Um, our population has to be prepared, and that's where good people like Mr. Lawrence next to me certainly help out. We got to recognize that our city is very, very, very diverse. And when I use the word diverse, I use that in the absolute broadest context. Uh, geography, it's different if you live down, uh, if you live downtown south of Broad, or if you live on the east side, or if you live in West Ashley, or if you live in Daniel Island. Everybody has something different. Um, if your family is here or not, that's a big change for Charleston. Charleston was a place where everybody that came had their family right here. Our population today, I would argue, as more and more people move into the uh, their, their immediate family don't live here in Charleston like they did years ago. So if you need to get out, if you need that help, it's not right there for you. Um, economic differences, obviously, are colleges. I mean, back in 1989, again, I would argue that you look a lot of these houses in some of our neighborhoods, there's maybe two people in those houses with two cars. Today, with all of the colleges and college students, you've got five, six, seven people living in there with five, six, seven cars that you get a storm surge, and that pushes those cars out in the way. You now really have a problem. Plus, you've got to keep track of those students and those people as things come along. Um, and not to mention our five-plus million visitors a year that are here that are coming into town. We did not really see that much of a drop even during the flood. We need to educate our population. As I said, that's number one. In events like this, you just can't overemphasize in this initiative, that is so important because it's very difficult to reach all of these diverse populations I mentioned. But we really need to focus on our vulnerable populations, um, our elderly, our disabled, our economically challenged. We know they're our most at risk population. We just know that. They can't get out. A lot of them don't have cars. Most of them don't have cars. It's not to say a lot. Most of them don't have cars. It takes neighborhoods. It takes churches. It takes communities. Um, to look after them and make sure that somebody's looking after them. And that's very difficult to do as your city is changing as rapidly as our city is changing. Collaboration, events like this here today, but really 
uh, from the emergency management perspective, years ago, emergency management was something that the fire department did as a collateral duty. Today, it's a profession led by FEMA. FEMA leads a lot of these. But really, we've got great partners here. Um, and my, myself, uh, just in the little one-person shop that I have, I'm involved in a lot of collaboration. Many of them are even here today. Our uh, National Academies of Science is here. Sea Grant is here. The National Weather Service, colleges, um, critical infrastructure, our communities, our employers. They're all people that we work with now on a regular basis. That didn't happen just three years ago. It's the changing face of emergency management in order to, to be effective. Um, I'd like to mention just very quickly, uh, we took a look at this problem about three years ago and there was a group of us here in the city, again, many of us here, and we, we came out of this. It was myself and folks in the water company and Laura and, and Rick from uh, Sea Grant. Uh, and we very quickly formed up a group called the Charleston Resilience Network, mentioned earlier today. But that's just a group of people uh, public private sector that decided to get together and say look we've got to start looking at this and our goal is really to bring the best science the best resources that we can for the rest of the population and make sure that we get out the best information uh, to everyone that's there the next thing we need to really do is acknowledge our limits our roads and bridges are what they are okay they're not changing our population is increasing okay our diversity of our population is increasing um, so we need to make early decisions and we need to err on the side of caution because that's where we need to be. We need to invest in response even though we're only going to use it sparingly. We need to make sure that we're putting the proper investments. And finally, what I'd like to say is that even though emergency management is the here and now, um, it must be included in future planning. It has to be included. That dialogue has to occur in the future planning for the city, the county, for the state. It's not there now. It needs to be. It's because this is an evolving science and now that we're at the table, it's some, not just myself in the city, but now that emergency management is at the table, it needs to be there. We need to consider the consequences of the actions that we take today. You've heard that from a number of people. We need to be there. Prioritize it. I would say education to the individual is the most important. Reaching 140,000 people collectively is difficult. They all have different means of communicating. Educating them is probably our biggest challenge and the most, uh, the, where I would prioritize most, ensuring each of the households has a plan. And then who's responsible? Again, I think it starts with individuals, it goes to communities, and then municipalities. You can't take it any higher than that. The federal government can come in and give you what they want, but they're really here for afterwards. If we don't take the actions in our community to do what we need to be prepared, shame on us. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Our next presenter and panelist is Mr. Arthur Lawrence, and Mr. Lawrence is the former president of the West Side Neighborhood Association in Charleston, South Carolina. Mr. Lawrence, do you believe that we as a community know enough about the impact of climate change to make it a priority? No, I don't think we uh, know enough because uh, I think we have a, a, a split uh, sector on that. You have the um, uh, economic part, and then you then you then you have uh, the, the climate change part. And some people you don't believe in climate climate change, and that's why we try to elect those officials that have climate change in their platform. But uh, what I would like like to see is that um, before we do anything in, in the peninsula or any place else, we need to have a risk assessment definitely in place before they build and see how that risk assessment, how this development would affect the rest of the community and also have a, a, a detailed plan and also plan for Murphy because, you know, I have a, a diverse background and I used to work for the nuclear um, uh, part of the, um, the country and with nuclear turbines and, and coal burn turbines. And also, I used to live uh, in the city during the winter time, and then on a farm in, in, in the summertime. And uh, what uh, I usually fight for the people that are most affected. Because sometimes, when you're on top of the mountain, you don't hardly come down to, to the valley, and the people in the valley sometimes get uh, left out. And uh, how things affect the neighborhood. And uh, we talk about building uh, seawalls, but when I look at Bertle Bank Park and how that affects, you know, 
the community that where I live in, and uh, we we love water, but uh, when when the Ashley River and you have that tide surge, you have water coming from the Ashley River into the into the community, and uh, and those vulnerable people, those are the people that are affected. When we water our lawn, lawn and and these development, when you look at most of the people in the city, the people that are affected, they don't water their lawns. And so they plant things or have things planted that don't use that much uh, of water. And so we have to look at uh, the most vulnerable people. We have to look at the Gullah Geechee corridor. And uh, we definitely have to, uh, when we develop a plan, develop those plans for the most vulnerable people First, they should be our priority because when we when we build a development, we build a development around that community, and that development affect those most vulnerable vulnerable people. So we need to make sure that we we take care of the whole community, not part of the community. And that's why I was fighting all my time here in, in, in the city of Charleston. And uh, I think the mayor should give that $100 gold coin to Ms. Cavanich. <laughs> I'll pass that along to right, her. Yeah, right, because Take she, a note on that. <laughs> right. she, she did a fantastic job, especially with the, uh, the Fishburn Street and the uh, Seth McClark corridor of um, working with the mayor, Mayor Raleigh, and we worked with him to, to get that money to, for that development. And, and, and right now, I think we see a, a big help um, with the water surge. And uh, those things that, you know, I, I'm deeply concer concerned about. And, um, and, with, and with the heat, you know, I spent time in the, um, in the desert. And then I came back, came to Charles, back to Charleston. And was little, when I used to work on the farm, on my granddaddy's farm, it's a, it's a big difference. And the same thing now, you can tell that the, with the climate change, the heat is about the same. People can't hardly work outdoors now. So it's definitely a, 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 a climate change is, is happening. And uh, we, we must, must make big, all kind of effort to alleviate uh, people that are at risk to make sure that they are not affected because they're the last one that's being taken care of. I've worked with the city to pull signs up in the community. In case of an emergency, those individuals will know where to go to be picked up, to be transported out of the city of Charleston. And I think that was, that was, that was a good thing. Work with the city to make sure that those individuals who have cars and when they flood, they can take it to the parking garage. The city's doing a fantastic job um, with that. And, and then the other thing is that when people go to the hospital, especially around uh, medical you. And that, that's a place that we have to do something with because, you know, those people that are vulnerable who have to go to work to walk through that water, uh, to get treatment, uh, that, that should happen. So we, we need to really um, work, work, on, work on that. And, uh, you know, I think the par my priority is that we have to know where each dam in South Carolina is located at and where that water flows directly to. Because you know, in that, in that zone, the most vulnerable people live in that area. When, when we just had that large rain the other day, they let water out of those dams. And what happened? It went into those communities who was at risk. People are moving in there for, to buy a home and to find home, and they don't know that when they open those valves to release the water out of those dams, they will be affected. So they, everyone who live in those areas should, should know. And the other thing, we should have a plan to evacuate the most vulnerable people out of, the, out of their area. We need that. We need to, we, the city have over 150 neighborhood associations. We need to use those neighborhood associations to distribute information to, their, uh, to the public uh, what to do in case of emergency. And everyone in your family should have a kit. The Red Cross have a wonderful plan for different kits. 
and put that somewhere so that when an emergency happened, you'd be able to pick it up and leave. I'll give you a prime example. I believe the military taught me to have everything in place, look out for Murphy, and when we had Hurricane Hugo, my wife and the family, we went to Asheville, North Carolina. We took everything up and went into the mountain. And I look at my wife, and I say, we left our most important documents at home. But our youngest son said, no, Mom and Daddy, I have it right here. <laughs> he knew where everything was at. So that means you have to let everyone in your, in, in your household know where your important documents and things are. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mr. Lawrence. <laughs> and our next presenter and panelist is Ms. Susan L. Hitchcock. Ms. Hitchcock is the Historical Landscape Architect for the Cultural Landscapes Program at the National Park Service, the Southeast Regional Office. Not sure why that's coming down at this moment. Okay, <laughs> presenters, please lean forwards. <laughs> Your heads are not caught. Okay, she has slides. She has slides, audience. That's why it's coming down. Susan and I had a wonderful conversation on the phone as we prepared for this, and one of the things she said that I did not forget is, can we get back home? How is climate change affecting, sea level rise affecting how we live in our homes, how, we, how is it impacting our lifestyles? So Susan, without further ado. Thank you. Um, I'd like to express my appreciation to um, Dr. Rivers, all the sponsors, all of our panelists and our guests here today. This is a really vital, I think, coming together to discuss a very critical issue. Um, I'm from Columbia, but I lived in Charleston for 15 years, um, from 1978 to 1992. I left in 1992 to pursue graduate studies at the University of Georgia in historic landscape preservation, but don't worry, I don't pull for them, because <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm from Columbia, right? Um, so I really care about this community, um, and, and in fact, I am hoping to retire here in three years, so I want to make sure we get it right. I mean, we have a king tide. Um, I was, um, I had an appointment back in uh, last August when we had one of those king tide events, and um, I, I called the person I was supposed to meet at the College of Charleston, and I just said, you know, I am not going to be able to, I do not feel comfortable coming downtown now. And I have to tell you, you know, the media really did a great job. I knew that it wasn't a good idea to get in my car. So I want to make sure we get it right here because I really care about this community. Um, but a little bit more about what I do um, as a historical landscape architect. I um, provide technical assistance to parks in the southeast region of the National Park Service. And um, our, so our region co uh, covers a very large amount of territory. We cover North Carolina, and then we go all the way down uh, Florida, but also including the Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico. We go over to Louisiana and then up through Kentucky. So we have a very large region that we're responsible for. Um, we. I hope you know about our three parks here in town. We have Fort Sumter, Fort Moultrie, and Charles Pinckney. Um, but we have many different kinds of parks in the southeast region. We have battlefields, uh, coastal fortifications, um, historic sites, uh, natural areas like national seashores, and then the more traditional type of national parks like um, the Great Smokies, the Blue Ridge Parkway, and the Everglades. I'm always struck when I talk to people about the National Park Service, and I'm in a particular state, they'll say, oh, and I, well, I'll mention a park, and they'll go, oh, isn't that a state park? And I'm like, no. Just because it's not a big national park doesn't mean it's not a national park. Those parks are, that you're talking about are in our national park system. So cultural resources, that's what I'm all about. So what does that mean? Um, cultural resources include historic buildings, archeological sites, cultural landscapes, ethnographic resources, and museum collections. 
And these cultural resources experience the same climate change effects as their natural resource counterparts, which is what I'm sort of all about talking about today. Current trends suggest that the rates and our intensity of these factors are already increasing, as our panelists have already spoken about. Climate change projections indicate that these resources are likely to be altered, deteriorated, deteriorated or destroyed at faster rates or in rates not previously observed. And I think that's the key element, that it's, it's something that we haven't previously observed that's going to have a more uh, dramatic effect on cultural resources. And now we're looking at the four pillars. Um, the climate change response strategy for the National Park Service has four pillars. Science, mitigation, adaptation, and I think very important, communication. Uh, Director John Jarvis has addressed these essential questions with respect to the National Park Service, cultural resources, and climate change. What is climate change adaptation for cultural resources? How should we make decisions related to cultural resources in light of climate change? And more importantly, how do we communicate regarding climate change science and impacts? Um, unlike natural systems, um, cultural resources are dependent upon people to help them withstand climate change. So our adaptation strategy for cultural resources considers climate change impacts to specific locations materials and significance of these resources and the sustainability and feasibility of potential responses. And the last slide, I want to end with talking about non-economic loss, which I think is really important in this conversation, particularly in this community. We're looking at an image of a gala uh, gathering out at Charles Pinckney. So there's much to um, learn and share from what we call traditional eco ecological knowledge, the weather and disaster-related memories and practices of traditional communities. Every place has a climate story, and many have more than one. Some are told in various ways by the people who have lived and worked on the land for generations. So in other words, we have to consider life ways as well as bricks and mortar cultural resources. And I'm just going to end with a quote from Director John Jarvis. We must be committed to talking about climate change service-wide in our internal and external communications, including acknowledging the uncertainty we face as we make management decisions that will have long-term consequences for cultural resources. And you wanted me to, um, well, a recommendation, collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. I mean, that is so important. In the National Park Service, we are guilty of what we call operating in silos, and we've got to break those silos down. Um, I have been most excited recently by um, interdivision collaboration. Um, I've been lucky enough um, in the past year to go, well, couple of years to go um, out to Fort Pulaski in Savannah and also out to Cumberland Island in Georgia to be part of a multidisciplinary team looking at erosion, which now when we talk about climate change, I think it's already been mentioned, but we're not just talking about sea level rise. We are talking about all kinds of different um, events and erosion is is a biggie is a really a biggie and so we are now beginning to look at this in an interdisciplinary way which we have to do we have to start not just operating in silos and you talked about prioritizing now in cultural resource management we prioritize or we have done in the past by significance in other words um, let's just look at the Charleston area. We have Fort Sumter, okay, we consider that a nationally significant resource, not only because of the start of the Civil War, but let's think about the leg legacy of enslavement, that whole story. So that we consider a very important resource. But what would you do compared, let's say, that 
structure, that building sitting out in the middle of the harbor, versus the life ways on the barrier islands. How would you prioritize that? Would you say one is more important than the other? So there's a lot of uncertainty. And th the thing I would close with is acknowledging that there is going to be loss. When we look at cultural resources, we have to acknowledge that there is going to be loss. And the tricky job is figuring out how to mitigate that loss. Community, we've heard from our panelists, and now it's your turn. One of the things I understood them to say is it starts with us. Um, we as community members need to make the change that is needed in our community by working with our elected officials and our national elected officials to bring the change that our community needs. This is the time where an opportunity um, is presented to you to ask questions of our panelists. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Gladi Fadeya, one more again. I'm Queen Quet, Chief and Head of State for the Gullah Geechee Nation, founder of the Gullah Geechee Sea Island Coalition, and also a founding member of the Gullah Geechee Fishing Association. Now, I want to crack my teeth with the last one, but Hunter Chillin' what they up here. So I'm figuring most of you understood what I said, but I'll help out the transplants. <laughs> All right? <laughs> so I am, I'm very pleased that the last two presenters definitely mentioned Gullah Geechee because I was counting down how much time it was going to take in this meeting. <laughs> All right, in Charleston, before I heard Gullah Geechee. I was very concerned about the fact that commercial and recreational fisheries was mentioned once again. And all of you, I think, addressed at some point how economics becomes one of the primary focus points, focal points, and primary points of interest when this is discussed over and over. And I do this work all over the world, so I'm used to hearing that. But it concerns me when we do have groups of people who are subsistence fishers, and that is not mentioned, because you cannot talk about the cultural landscape that is the Gullah Geechee Nation, that the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor runs through, without discussing the fact that it was Gullah Geechee hands that shaped the landscape. That these now are the people that you said are the most vulnerable right. to water, <laughs> to people releasing water from dams onto our communities, but also not considering us in calculating the cost of what happens if you risk losing a culture. So I wondered if any of you want to address how within any of the context of your work, other than those who already mentioned it very briefly, how to deal with life ways. Because life ways and festival presentations are not the same thing. And there are many of us living on the front of the shore that have been talking about this before they called it climate change. And nobody listened. And I'm a scientist by degrees. So they thought we were the emotional natives until now. Now everybody wants our traditional knowledge, but they're still not calculating the cost of what happens if you lose the people who live the traditions. And how do we get engaged fully together to make sure that we're part of what you're calculating and discussing? So thank you, thank, thank you, you for the work and for all of we to work together. Panelist. Most people don't yes, understand or know about the mosquito flea, a couple of blocks uh, down the street. And uh, if you know about the mosquito flea, that's how the black fishermen used to earn their livelihood. Right. They had um, one boat with an engine and the other boat tied behind that one and pulled them out to the, to the sea. But when they start putting all this regulation, permit, and everything like that, they'll eliminate most of those, those individuals and it went corporate. When they start going corporate, that's when you start um, eliminating people from, from, the, from the system. So we have, we have to work on that to make sure that we don't eliminate anyone. It's just like your small, small farmers. Your small farmers, when these corporate farms take over and use the bulk of the water and they have to cut back, who you think they're going to cut back on? These small farmers who don't have the resources. So we have to make sure that we have a complete package and think out the box how to solve the problem. 
Thank you, Mr. Warren's other panelists. Yeah, you know, I work mainly in federal fisheries management, which is, you know, beyond three miles. So we, we don't really touch on subsistence fishing very much, but the states do, I believe. The problem with, the reason subsistence fishing seems to be left out of the discussion is, is that by its nature, we don't, have, we don't know what those catches are. We don't know how many people are involved and we don't know what they're catching and how many. And so that's what fishery scientists do is gather that kinds of information to help manage the fishery. We would love to get more information on subsistence fishing. And over the past few years, you may be familiar with this, NOAA has been collecting oral histories of subsistence fishermen and trying to piece together the history of the fishery, including the mosquito fleet, um, which did fish offshore. You know, they fished out on the blackfish banks. And, um, and so w we gather that information, but it, it's, um, it's piecemeal. There hasn't been a, you know, there hasn't been a real organized way to collect that information. And I would, you know, we're very interested in improving that. We do want to get those oral histories because the people that participate in this fishery are, dis are they're disappearing. And particularly subsistence fisher fishermen, the people that fish from shore and that fish from the bridges, we just don't have a lot of information on them. And NOAA would be very, and the state fishery management agencies as well would be very much interested in getting more information on them because they're going to be impacted by sea level rise and erosion and ocean acidification more than the offshore fishermen. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you for this amazing discussion. Uh, my name is Mark Gould. I'm associated with we got it. Citizens Climate Lobby. And uh, I just wanted to ask the panelists in general if you have any thoughts on how you can take this vast knowledge we've accumulated about local impacts and bring that to bear on influencing decisions at the federal level, since ultimately this is all caused by the amount of fossil fuels we consume. And it's a global problem, and not every community in the world can afford to spend lots of money on drainage projects. And um, the whole world's going to be affected. Yes. And so we need global solutions led by the US. And I was just wondering how panelists feel about how your knowledge could be brought to bear on influencing legislation at, a, at the federal level to reduce fossil fuel consumption. I'll, I'll, I'll jump on that one. Um, I, I, it probably won't answer your question completely, but I think I'll begin to make a start, and that is how do you take what's going on locally and get it national attention, which then gets the national attention of our national leaders, which could have an impact globally. And, you know, there's, in Charleston, we're one of those cities, blessed or accursed, that we, there's a lot of people looking at us right now, and therefore we get a lot of collaboration and a lot of interest at the national level. Uh, for about two years now, Charleston's been in a project with the National Academies of Science, um, who brings some of the best scientists in the world to take a look at. We're one of four pilot communities that they're looking at on this topic around the globe, or around the country, I'm sorry. And those folks there, once that information is gathered here, and there's many information gathering sessions going on here, that gets brought back to them and back to Washington, D.C., and then put into reports that are then, um, you know, help to, you, to influence legislation going forward. But that's not the only one. The Department of Homeland Security is here quite a bit, Department of Energy, USGS. They all come to Charleston, and they all want to collaborate with us because they want to learn from us at the local community level. It doesn't answer your question about fossil fuels, and, and I don't have an answer for that. That's not my world of expertise. But on how we get it from local to global, I think Charleston is one of the communities that's actually helping to facilitate that going forward. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Marilyn Glover, and I live in the 10 mile uh, neighborhood of Owendaw. We are an unincorporated area. Um, we are um, one of the older uh, black communities um, in the county. Um, my concern is that we are now um, living in an area where planned developments are being built all around us. My concern is who will assist us with drainage? We are, there's a neighborhood that's going to be built with more than 100 houses. We've got Tupelo that's already built, been built. 
how does this impact us as far as drainage? And um, I don't know if there's any study that has been done other than the developers saying they're going to put in place certain things for their community, but how will it impact our community? And who do we go to? I noticed um, Ms. Cabanis uh, brought to my attention um, the drainage issue, as well as Mr. Lawrence and how his neighborhood has been affected. But my concern is when they build these large communities and we are there, and somehow the water seems to flow back on us, who's planning for everything? Who do we go to? Because we are unincorporated, and Mr. Wilbert, we are also urban on the east side of Highway 17 now. So the west side is not urban, but we are urban. So there's a, I don't know how these things are being planned or how they've been planned, but we are vulnerable citizens. And I think that's all I wanted okay. to say. Okay, I think I can take that question because we work closely with Charleston County and the city and Charleston County each have um, a process of reviewing new development and the drainage plans associated with that development. So if it was in the city, you would come to my office and we would be happy to share with you what, what the developer is, is, is proposing and then verifying that what he's proposing is accurate. In Charleston County, you're gonna reach out to Charleston County Public Works Department. Um, the director of the department is Mr. Neal, James Neal, and um, he'll get you in touch with the right person there. But you know, federal, there are now federal regulations in place that we all have to enforce and that are um, brought down from the EPA through the State Department of Health um, um, and Envir uh, DHEC anyway, and we've all got plans in place now for reviewing development. Thank you. Mr. Lawrence? Uh, with the West Edge coming into our neighborhood, and most people know about the development of the West Edge, and just like with the Joe Raleigh Stadium, we were in front of all of that development. And before the community support any development, you have to make sure that they have a drainage plan and make sure that they will, the water won't affect the resident that who lived there. You have to show that to the community first. And then you have to have, you have to know you should have a representative on county council. You need to hold mm -hmm. th those individuals accountable for any development, and any development should come to the come to the community before it, before it's get established. But don't wait until the horse out of the barn. Get ahead of the, ahead of the plan. Thank you, Mr. Warren. We have um, yes, please stand. Um, thank you for everybody and for this initiative about uh, climate change. Uh, I'm really deeply uh, actually affected by that, and because I'm a big. Envir environmentalist and I love my nature. Um, I have a question. I heard a lot about the effects of climate change, but we, we know that climate change is caused by carbon emission, green ga greenhouses, gas, so basically human activities. I was, I was actually expected that during the talks we will have some numbers about the situation of Charleston in affecting global warming. What, are, what is air pollution right now? What is water pollution right now? What are the main causes? Do we have any numbers? And so from now, we can assess and reduce our impact to the planet because as you said, nothing is static. Everything is dynamic. Whatever you do on a personal level will in some ways affect myself and the other and the world. So I was asking actually, I wonder if Laura would have any numbers about it? or if any studies have been done about um, the pollution in Charleston and how to move forward so we can have years after years um, a global assessment and if we are successful or no. Thank you. Any panelists wanna take that one? 
I'll be glad to talk about it. I'm not a, uh, a broad pollution, but uh, you know, certainly we do the wastewater treatment for the city of Charleston and the surrounding areas. And you know, taking a historical perspective, back in the 60s, there was no wastewater treatment here. All the sewage simply flowed yeah. into the uh, Ashley, in River. Ashley River, around the Cooper, the harbor, yeah. and there were massive fish kills. Uh, if you go back into the uh, Post and Courier archives, you can find numerous articles that will almost just make the uh, shivers run up and down your back, quite frankly, as to how bad it was. Today, the harbor is, you know, much, much better. You can swim there, you can ski there, uh, you can fish there, and primarily because a lot of effort has been made over the years to improve uh, wastewater treatment. Uh, the city of Charleston, uh, through Plum Island, now treats all of its waste, Mount Pleasant, um, you know, North Charleston. Uh, you know, all of this waste is now captured and treated, and so the harbor and things are in much, much better condition than they've ever been. There's a uh, overriding document called the Total Maximum Daily Load for the Charleston Harbor and its estuary systems, which has been a negotiated policy between you know, all of the water users in, in the Charleston area, up and down the Cooper River, up and down the Ashley, over in the Mount Pleasant, Sullivan's Island, and they all cooperated to agree to meet certain limitations so that the dissolved oxygen in the harbor stays high enough to support fish life. And all of these organizations report data back to the uh, state government, which goes up to the federal government on a monthly basis. So it's carefully monitored and controlled. So from a water pollution control standpoint, we're in much better shape than we've ever been before. Now, does that mean there's not more work to be done? Of course not. Uh, you know, nutrient control is another big thing that will be in the future that will help control you know, the amount of algal growth in the water, which will help improve dissolved oxygen in the water. So there's a number of things that can still be done. Uh, air pollution wise, um, I can just say for Charleston water system, all of you know, the generator sets and everything that we have uh, meet current you know, federal and state air pollution requirements. Uh, we are looking at changing things to reduce our energy usage. I mentioned that about how much electricity you know, is involved in producing clean water and drinking water. So you know, we're taking steps to reduce our energy usage on the long-term basis, which helps with you know, that global warming, the production of greenhouse gases. So I think uh, certainly all of us are aware of that. Uh, each one of us comes back that we have to make changes in our own lives, everything from you know, driving smaller cars to you know, you know, maybe getting out that bicycle every now and then. But um, you know, it's a good question. It's something that we all have to continue to work on. Thank that you. was kind of a rambling. That's rambling. okay. Thank you, Andy. And I think the Department of Health and Environmental Control yeah. can also provide you additional data relative hmm. to those specific questions that you ask. We had one additional question here. My name is George Carahallis. I live in the Shadow Moss community and have a great appreciation of what it means to manage flood water. Um, but beside that, I'm also a person who is by training a strategic thinker, a strategic manager. And what I heard from the panel today, and maybe someone can straighten me out on this, is that there is not an integrated regional plan that addresses all of the things that have been brought up by individual pa uh, members of the panel, but also that it hasn't been really defined in terms of the question, the WIFM question, what's in it for me? Because the communication piece that uh, uh, Ms. Hitchcock mentioned is an important part of getting across what each of the individuals in a community need to be doing. Unless you can clarify what's in it for them and have that tie in turn to a plan that leads you toward that integrated outcome that you want, you're not going to get there. I liked in particular the way that you segmented the information in your plan for the National Park Service. My son works for the National Park Service. He's out in Louisiana. Same problem, you know, he's knee deep in water all the time. 
I, I think that a part of the problem is that we have not done enough to formalize our thinking across all the different disciplines in such a way that it achieves what I'm describing as a regional strategic plan for climate and environmental control. There may be such a beast. I have not heard of it or seen it. I, I would sure appreciate knowing uh, more about it if such exists. And uh, I also want to mention that my consultant's nose started twitching when I heard certain things being said about silos. Because silos are what will kill our ability to be able to achieve the long-term result that this group in this room and up front are talking about. Absolutely. And until we use good communication techniques that are built off of sound science and an integrated approach to solution, you, you won't get what you want. Absolutely. So I guess my Thank question you. is yes. strategy. Okay. Is there a strategy that will take us there that really comprehensively addresses and integrates and communicates that across populations? I'll go ahead and start. I mean, you know, a couple of years ago when the Department of Homeland Security came down here and they had a tabletop workshop where we had members from across the community, the county, the utilities, different cities all came together. And, and Mark mentioned earlier, as a result of all of these individuals getting together, a number of us decided this was an opportunity to, co to continue that and make that a formal process for Charleston. And as a result, we've developed the Charleston Resilience Network. And the network is now applying for and receiving grants that's going to um, expand some of the science knowledge about how we're affected by sea level rise. But it's also um, not just going to focus on sea level rise, and it's going to focus on, on all kinds of factors that affect our resiliency eventually down the road. I think you'll be hearing more and more about the Charleston Resilience Network. It's really kind of um, taken its baby steps so far, but it's recently received a huge grant, and you're going to hear more about that. And on that network is a number of people from the city of Charleston. Um, We've asked somebody from, um, we've got a member from Charleston Water System, SCENG. We are encouraging people from, we got a member from Charleston County, and we are encouraging others to, oh, and C Grant, <laughs> that's very important, and DHEC. Oh, great. So there's a piece of paper back there <laughs> on the Charleston Resiliency <laughs> Network. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think we're on to something here, and, um, but, you know, there's more that can be done, and we even, we have to break down our silos within our individual organizations. I was, I was trying to make the point, I don't know, you know, we've got to look at everything we do and how it's affected by climate change, how do we manage development, you know, what, what happens with, how do we manage our fleet operations, how do we, um, you know, what kind of equipment do we buy? And in, in all things, it, it needs to be looked at as an overall thing, and the question needs to be raised with every activity that we do. We can't hear. With the reflection, I was so grateful when they had environmental justice to come to Charleston a few years ago. And part of that was to have a brownfield study. Our neighborhood, which is North Central Neighborhood Association, was one of the neighborhoods included in the Brownsville. If you ever travel up the King Street Extension, you're truly grateful for how it's been cleaned up because there was not only debris, but a lot of pollution in the area. We had old airplanes, we had trucks. So for the residents that live in that area, in our area, it was a lot to deal with, not only with water, drainage, and then with pollution. So Brownsville cleaned up that area. So when you look at that area, I'm grateful for what they did. So my question is for Rosemount and other areas, we have a plant, a chemical plant called Solga. Rhodia was the one that originally had a chemical explosion. So the residents in the area had to go into closing the doors and everything, but some of the people were affected and developed cancer and other things. So my question is, what can we do to either get Brownsville back down here or to do something to clean the air for the older residents who live near the plant to help it to be more viable for them in their older age? 
the city is now evaluating whether we pursue additional Brownfields grants. Um, and certainly the Brownfields grants deal more with specific land and any pollution and or perceived pollution on that land or contamination more specifically on the land. So we are evaluating now whether we should pursue additional opportunities through EPA to address those matters. Thank you. I'm a born and raised uh, Charlestonian, and I just want to take this time to speak on behalf of the many committed educators that I know um, are in this room and to call attention to the work um, that they're all doing in this area of, of risk assessment and looking at the problem of, of shifting baselines and accepting perhaps new normals. Um, but I also want to ask, I see one young student here in this room, and he's our future. And I want to ask on behalf of the educators and the parents in here, what are the risks associated with not making climate change literacy um, a key component of our local science curriculum? And I want to give a nod to um, ocean scientists like, like Dr. Sedbury, who worked with a consensus of dedicated marine scientists back in the in two th way back in 2007 to come up with a definition of ocean literacy. And it asked, what is our impact on the ocean and the ocean's impact on us? What if you then said, what is climate literacy, climate change literacy? And into our schools ask, what is climate change's impact on me, there's your WIFM question, and my impact on climate change and just throw that out and bring our school board uh, into this dialogue. That's all I would like Thank to you. throw out. Thank yeah. You. Panelists. No. You're here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, one more question. And I, okay. We went there. Okay. I'm an energy policy <laughs> manager for the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy. I was born and raised in Charleston County, and I'm very happy to have now returned about a month ago. I've been living in Knoxville. Um, one of the things that I work a lot on is to advance energy efficiency programs through the utilities and municipalities and other entities, um, and most particularly low-income energy efficiency programs. Now, I've heard from Mr. Lawrence about you know the, the very important fact that Low-income people are some of the most at-risk populations for the consequences of climate change. Um, and I, I've heard a lot about water impacts. You know, I, I've heard about historical development. But I, I lo really look at um, low-income energy efficiency as something that we can do now that not only helps to build resiliency, but helps to prevent uh, further exacerbation of climate change. And the reason for that is, you know, as the temperatures heat up, we have a real public health crisis. If you live in an old historical building, um, it's going to leak like a sieve, most likely. And most low-income folks don't have five to $10,000 to fix all of that and get a new HVAC system and get their utility bills down. Uh, they're, they're often paying around a quarter of their income on utility bills when that could be slashed, eas easily cut in half with these really inefficient homes. And, and your question for us is? My question is, so from a historical development perspective, you know, neighborhood um, advocacy, um, you know, emergency preparedness, a water utility, infrastructure management, oceans management, I see that there, there should be intersection with all of these. So how have y'all worked or looked into low-income energy efficiency retrofit programs as something that can shoe into your own work for helping to plan for a holistic approach to climate resiliency? Uh, we work with the Sustainability Institute and other uh, local nonprofits to assist low and moderate income individuals with renovating and rehabilitating their home. The city has also administered the Department of Housing and Urban Development grants since 1975 that provide those same level of services to individuals to help improve their home. So that's one aspect and one component that we provide um, that speaks to the question that you pose. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> good afternoon. My name is Stuart Williams, and I have a private foundation here 
in Charleston, its purpose to drive positive impact for humanity and the environment. In 1993, which is eons ago, I published a thesis called Making a Profit While Making a Difference, and the rest of the world thought I'd lost my mind. Uh, today, of course, everyone's focused on that, so I want to go to education, because at the end of the day, unless we educate our youth into social and environmental entrepreneurship, where the greatest wealth creation will come over the next 50 years, we won't achieve anything of the great work that you're doing. I decided to come to Charleston because I designed an entire program for the country of Paraguay to build its emerging economy on the principles of people, planet, and prosperity. And we're rolling that out in Charleston now. I just funded at the College of Charleston a six-credit program on social and environmental entrepreneurship. We had 380 student applications for 21 seats. So what we've done now, <coughs> and everyone's welcome, is we're going to run that program in the evenings. It's not accredited. It's called the Future Impact Leaders Program. And any community member can come because we have to take in-place education. We have to go into the communities, teach people social and environmental entrepreneurship, teach people about the tenets of a local living economy so that everyone can participate in driving a sustainable future, sustainable economies, sustainable environment, sustainable communities, instead of hoping that they observe. So my question is, that's what I and others are doing in the private sector to try and embed that kind of education within the community of Charleston. What, is, what are your organizations doing that maybe we can collaborate with and be supportive of that? This may be a very specific, specific issue, but one of the things that we, the city is required to do regarding stormwater is to provide a lot of public education on stormwater. And we do that through the Ashley Cooper River Consortium, but we're also looking at ways that we can um, put more information out there on our own and be more proactive. Um, teaching folks about stormwater management and pollu the pollution and stormwater runoff um, and those kinds of things and better, better best practices around your house and that kind of stuff. It starts with us. They are wonderful ideas. We will give our panelists a hand and thank you so much for your participation today.